Welcome to Talking Points uh, this Saturday evening with Stephen Taylor. It's good to have you here. Uh, this evening we're chatting to a man who have, uh, I've been following for many years now and uh, someone that I call a friend as well. Uh, formerly the uh, general manager at Western Province Cricket, now the CEO, uh, Mr. Nabil Dean. Good, uh, good evening, sir. Welcome to Dean TV. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. So tell, me about, so tell me about you as a person before we get into your role at Western Province Cricket. Tell me about like where you grew up. Uh, do you call Cape Town home? Um, were you born in Cape Town? Tell me about a bit of your background before we get. Yeah, ironically, I wasn't born in Cape Town. Right. I was born in Egypt, um, you know, and came here as a young boy, you know, being four years old. My father was a religious leader and studied in Egypt, met my mother, and that's how I ended up in Cape Town. Uh, but I see myself very much as South African because I've, been, I've lived all my life here. Um, yeah, my, my, I went to school, in, in, I went to high school at Harold Cressy High School, um, then went to University of Cape Town, okay. Um, did a bit of studying, uh, and I worked first as a social worker, I qualified as a social worker. Wow. Uh, my first four years worked as a social worker, my next nine I worked as a school teacher Jeez. in Mitchell's Plain, Tafels of Mitchell's Plain. Um, and I followed that up with a, uh, a stint as a business, worked in business for two years. Um, and after that, I entered cricket. And that's where I've been ever since. So did you study to get into cricket or how? I mean, no, 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 I, 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 advice, I you know? yes, I think the, the, the important thing is that I was always absolutely passionate about sport and particularly two codes of sport and the one was cricket and one was athletics. So as an 18 year old already, I already became uh, administrator, I had started administering in, in cricket and did athletics. Uh, I did play, I, never, I can't claim to have played at any significant level, uh, but I did play. Um, I did, however, receive my, up to my national colours in athletics, because that was the code I enjoyed thoroughly. Uh, but yes, always been involved in the administration of cricket. As a school teacher, I convened Western Province Senior Schools Cricket. Um, you know, so I, as I say, always been involved, and we initiated and formed with a guy by the name of Armin Jacobs, we, we, we initiated and formed a club in the early 80s, uh, which, we, which was focused mainly on youth cricket, on junior cricket. And that's always been my passion, mm. is, is, is the youth. Um, and coming into Western Province Cricket Association in 1997, I came there as a youth coordinator and quickly worked myself into a youth manager and then youth and development manager. You know, um, and that was very much, as I say, my passion through those years. So tell me about the difference of the different people. I mean, you were general manager before, um, you now see oh, the difference in jobs, because I mean, if anyone thinks about that, it's kind of like the same, general manager, CEO, is, is it different? Look, I think the CEOs, it's, it's, the difference is, yes, a general manager, you're general manager of Western Province Cricket Association. When, when you take the chief executive's job, it involves three entities, which is Western Province Cricket, right? Then you have Western Cape Cricket, which is the Cobras, which is the professional arm. And then you also have Western Province Professional Cricket, which is an entity which has a relationship with Supersport, which is a 50-50 partnership. So when you take over the CEO's role, you become the CEO of all three of those entities, and you're responsible for all three, right? Besides the, 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 the income streams that have to come in there, and you've got to generate whatever you need to keep the, the business going, right? With a general manager, in to and you, you're purely in the one company, which is Western Province Cricket. Okay, and uh, there your role is, was particularly amateur cricket, where you then you basically assist the then CEO, my predecessor, who was Professor Andre Odendal, where you assist him in spe certain special projects as such. You understand me? As a CEO, I think it's an oversight role over everything. So the president works. reports to you? No, 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 it works the other way. Oh you right, know, really? It works the other way because the president is chairman of the board, and right. I report to the board. I don't necessarily report to the president, but I report to the board. That's very confusing. How does that work? Yeah. Uh, well, basically, in terms of the governance, is that you do the operations. Okay, they make the policy. So that's how a board works. Okay. I report to three boards. You understand me? As I mentioned, the entities. Mm. So I end up reporting to three boards, and uh, all three of them have got different chairs. You know, so, so ultimately, as governance works, your board, and therefore the chairman of the board, those are your bosses because they determine the policy that you have to then go and, go and enact. So the Cape Cobras is a franchise. Yeah. It forms, it incorporates uh, Borland Cricket as part of that. Tell me about that. Yeah, uh, Cape Cobras would be a fran, yeah, it's, it incorporates not only Borland Cricket, but also, it also incorporates 
southwestern districts. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, yeah, as or just soon after I took over the position in February of last year. Okay, that was one of the first things I did, was to, to, to make sure that Western Cape cricket is actually Western Cape cricket. Southwestern districts is part of Western Cape. You know, but they were always reporting into the Warriors franchise, which is Eastern Cape. Mm. So we quickly fixed that. And uh, by June of last year, they had become part of, of, of the, the Western Cape franchise. And they are now very much part of the Western Cape franchise. So, um, yes, so that, 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 as I say, that is the professional arm. You know, so the semi-pro teams and what they do in the semi-pro teams feeds our Cobras team, which is your pure professional side. So how long have you been CEO of Western Province Cricket now? Well, it's just over a year. Okay, okay I took and the is position. There is, there, is there, how long does it last for? No, I think you get you you contracted. So my first contract was for three years, and I've already and one just over a year's post. Okay, so you still two years to go. What would you, what are you hoping to achieve as CEO? What are you what are you wanting to um, leave uh, behind as a legacy? Yeah. Look, I think there's a there's a few things, right? And I think importantly, um, you know, when when taking over the franchise. Okay, you must remember we, we unfortunately have franchise, but I'm not talking only about the franchise, but as an association of Western Province Cricket Association, as a, as, an, as, a, as a whole, right? That not too long ago, because with the World Cup, we bought the stadium. Oh, wow. Right, so we own Newlands Cricket Ground, okay? Um, but with that came a massive amount of debt. Mm. Um, and that debt has been a noose around our neck for a long, long time. Now, if I, can in, if I can say that that debt was nothing less than, by 2006, seven was, no, was, was almost 50 million rand. Sure. Okay? So where we are now, and I think that has been one of the targets for me, is that in my term that I'd like to see that eliminated. Well, what are you sitting on now? What are so we, we, at the moment, is around about 17. That's good. Yeah, so we've done fairly well this year. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I think even given the fact that as a, as a franchise, we didn't enjoy a team sponsor, you know, which means we were already in a deficit of four million before we started the season. Sure. Um, and that in itself was a, was a mass, massive challenge because one had to go and find, find that money and raise it so that we could in fact operate. It did impact on the team. You understand me? And I think uh, people don't always understand those things mm. because the kind of support structures you'd have for your team wasn't in existence this year, uh, purely because you didn't have the money to pay those people. You know, so we had to we had to go fairly lean. You know, um, I can't say lean and mean, but I mean we never we never won a trophy this year as the Cobras. That's right. You know, um, which is probably very disappointing for us. Uh, we did manage to get to a final, which we went to lose. Uh, we also made a playoff, which we got very close to another final. Um, and if people can remember that fateful day when the Cobras couldn't score 32 of 32 balls with seven wickets in hand. Yes. You know, uh, it's still a nightmare for, for, for a lot of us, but that was the reality, you know, um, the fact that we, we didn't get. So I think that, that, that for me is the important thing. The important thing is that we, we um, you know, we try and eliminate the debt as quickly as we can. With that comes an ambitious project that we, we want to embark upon, that we're waiting for the rights for, um, and that project is the redevelopment of Newlands. Uh, where we will bring activity into Newlands for a full year rather than just on match days. Right? And in that way we will create an income that will sustain us for, for the next hundred years. So what kind of entertainment? What are you talking about? Yeah, what we, we when I say, look the thing is what I'm not, we're still waiting for our rights from the city. Oh, so, so I'm not going to say too much <laughs> about it, but it's just basically creating a business entity rather than just a sporting entity. So bringing revenue in when there's no games. So you're going to have to bring. So there will be, we will, we will basically change most of our, the, the present suites to offices, right. rent them out and bring more business into the Newlands in terms of, you know, some commercial interest, restaurants, coffee shops, sport related activity, you know. So how many months of the year is there no cricket? How? I think the problem is, and, and that's changed slightly now, this year, because we now get much more product, international product, yes. because they now go to the main, the, only the five main stadia, and look after international product now. Are you one of those? Or you we are one of them. Okay. We are one of them. In fact, the prime one, uh, in terms of the numbers, we, we, we did very well, you know, um, mm. in this past uh, season with our internationals. You know, we had eight, basically eight days of, of international cricket, in and six yeah. of those eight were sold out. 
Sure, that's good. Eh? Which means we, we can be very pleased with the way this year's went. It's gone, you know. So that's the second thing when you talk about the legacy, that I would like to see that commence, mm. you understand me, and be part of getting that done, because that will mean that never again will our clubs or our schools, our youth, right, be able to, we won't have to search any longer for funding, right, to make those programs worthwhile. You know? and in terms of attendance, when it comes to the four-day game and the Cape Cobras and Western Province games, tell me about that. Is yeah, I think that's, that's a work in progress. Or yeah, it's very much work in progress. I think we, 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 we need to do a, a heck of a lot of marketing mm. and a heck of a lot of research into why things of the trend has, has changed. I believe, personally, our domestic product is poor, okay? Um, and I, uh, maybe I shouldn't be saying that out loudly, yeah. but I think, importantly, it's a fact. You know, and until we, we face that fact and address that fact, you understand me. What do you mean, the brand that you're putting out? I think the brands, no, no. I think what, what has happened is we can't build a, f a powerful brand. If you look at football and you look at some of the, in, in fact, even if you look at, at, at some of the other codes of sport, mm. right? In order to build your brand, you need your branded players. You need the players who made you so successful. So your national players must be part of your main competitions. That's right. Right? And uh, unfortunately in cricket, you know, often we don't have that. Mm. We, have, we have very important competitions when our national team is overseas. Right? We also sometimes have the players here, but they won't be released to us because of injury concerns yes. or yes. all those kinds of things. Um, so you can't have Ronaldo, for example, not being able to play for Portugal because then the Portugal brand will die. Yeah. Right. So similarly, we've got J.P. Dumini, we've got Hashim Amla, we've got Dale Stain, we've got these guys who should in fact be playing for us. And in that way, you probably then increase crowd significantly. That's right. You know, yes. but if there's, if I can almost call it players that the public don't know or don't know well enough, you understand me? Um, there's no desire to come and watch, mm. you know, and, but I must add that this is a trend across all codes and across the world. Okay. So it's not confined to us here at Newlands. Um, football is concerned. I think there was recently a Kaiser Chiefs Pirates game that only had 7,000 people. It was unheard of. Yes. You know, but even if you look at the Super Super is Super 16 now, uh, Super 18 now, you know, even if you look at that, mm. the, the crowds are dwindling. Mm. Um, you know, so there is an issue that television it's has taken, taken over. over. All right. Um, is it the economic climate, does that play a role as well? I think no doubt, no doubt. I think there's a number of factors, mm. but I think if you want to actually look, it's the one thing I believe is that we don't play with, uh, you know, we don't always have our best players available, yes. number one. And number two is, is television has played massive, because I think as far as TV is concerned, as far as cricket's concerned, the numbers have increased significantly if you speak to super sport. The viewerships have increased significantly, so there's a lot more people watching cricket. Everything's live. Everything's but they, accessible. But they don't. They're not coming to the stadium to watch mm. it. And tell me about uh, CSA. What uh, what kind of role do they play in Western Province cricket? Do they have a say over what happens? CSA is your mother body. Mm. Okay. Um, CSA, in terms of your amateur cricket, uh, provides probably 80% of the grant required to run cricket sure. in the province. So you'd, you'd receive a grant to run club cricket, to run youth cricket, um, you know, to run your umpires, to run your scorers. So all the different components of your amateur game, right, is funded somewhat by CSA, okay? You've got to go and find that extra 20%, and then you also got to enhance that if you want to increase your programs, you have to go and find extra money and extra sponsors to make it grow better, right? Um, when it comes to the professional game, the, the franchise game, there again, they make, a, when I say significant contribution, probably more like 75% sure. also of, of salaries and all those things they pay, you see. So we very much linked. I always say it's a mother-child relationship. So like a mother, will de direct how things should happen. You understand so me? they have a big say? They have a, they have a reasonably big, big say. Maybe, maybe that's something that must be looked at in the future because, I mean, I believe also as a result of that, you don't have that much autonomy and independence, you know, and often, you know, you have to, you have to check whether you want to go in a certain direction in terms of a revenue stream, whether it's acceptable to them or not, you know, when it comes to sponsors, if it conflicts with a national sponsor, um, you know, so all those things are factors, you know, that impact on, 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 on our game.
you know. Uh, but I think at the moment, to, for every affiliate in the country, if it wasn't for CSA, I don't think any of us would survive. That's right. So I know a lot of people know about Western Province Rugby. That's very prominent. People know Western Province Cricket not so much. Tell me about that brand of cricket and how you're wanting to grow that. Because that's, that's where the youngsters start out, right? Yeah, look, as I said to you right up front, there's the Western Cape Cricket, which is your Cobras franchise, which is basically your professional arm. Mm -hmm. okay? Your amateur arm is Western Province Cricket. And Bulland, even though they're part of the franchise, they have Bulland Cricket which is their amateur arm, and Southwestern District, which is their amateur arm. So anything from mini cricket, you understand me? And as you go through the ranks, I mean, you have mini cricket, you have girls cricket, you have women's cricket, right? You have youth cricket, you have disabled cricket or blind cricket and deaf cricket. Sure. Okay. And then you have your club cricket. And above that now today, we have a, a academy. Okay. So you have a Western Province Academy. And then sitting right on the pinnacle of this pyramid of amateur game is your semi-professional team or your Western province team. Why is it only semi-professional? Why is it not professional? I think it's a funding factor. Okay. Okay. And when I say semi-professional, again, Cricket South Africa comes to the party here. And basically seven players get paid. Wow. And it's players that we must identify as potential Cobras. So it's almost junior Cobra contracts. Sure. Okay, so they don't get paid them much. Often it's more, more or less younger guys who are coming through the ranks. Uh, they don't get, you can't live off that wage. Yeah. You understand me? Um, but seven of them get looked after. And, and at the academy level, four of them get looked after, but mainly through bursaries to go and study. And how many people are in the team? Well, basically you have a squad of about 18 at, at, at semi-pro level. Does, does that affect the morale in the team? Because out of that 18, seven are paid to be there. The others think, okay, that's, how do I feel about that? I mean, I'm, I'm here, you know. Often guys, I think, understand why those seven are being paid. Okay. Because it's simply, it's, it's simply what they've come through and where they are and more likely to be. Those others, you understand me, need to do the necessary to, to make the selectors believe that they deserve to get that semi-professional contract. Um, so I think it's competitive all the way. The guys, you know, we've got a, a classic example of a boy who was in our academy, Jason Smith. He was sitting in our academy amongst those four places. He was not a semi-professional. He had a fantastic season because a place became available. He's a former South African under-19 boy. A place became available in a semi-pro team, right? And he never looked back because when he came into that position, he scored 100. Sure. You understand me? And he's then played in every single game since then. And because of his performances, got one opportunity in the Cobras in a one-day game. Um, and in that opportunity, scored 50 wow. in, his, in his debut game. Wow. Um, and looked very impressive and landed himself a, a Cobras contract. Sure. So he went from the academy straight to the Cobras. So who signs that contract? Do you sign the contract? Do you take the player on? How does it work? Yeah, yeah no, I'm, I'm directly involved with that. Okay. Uh, obviously the head coach, who's Paul Adams in our case, mm. you know, and then you have a playing affairs committee. So you, you, you do that and you make your recommendations to that playing affairs committee, who then uh, agrees and that recommendation goes to your board for, for sign off. And your view on the four day game of cricket, do you think that that will eventually die out? I would hope, I would hate to see that happen. Okay, I, I still believe that is really where you learn your cricket. Yes. I think that's where you learn most things about cricket, whether it be technique or anything else. Um, and I'm, 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 yeah, I'm sad, uh, sorry actually, you know, when you think about the impact that the, the, the modern game or the T20 game has had on test cricket, mm. you know, and you see, you don't see that, that dedication and commitment and everything else. I don't know if it's just the nature, the society's nature that everything is quick yes, and everything is fast. Uh, but to be honest with you, I don't think that Test cricket will die out. I can't see it happen. No, it's been around for so many years. However, however, we mustn't lose sight of the fact that the money that's made in cricket today is in the T20 game. That's right. Um, you know, and ultimately, you know, I don't know, the, the economics seem to dominate. You know, I, I values seem to be eroded when economics dominate, you know, and that's what's happening. Mm. You know, so when we, when I, I still believe that we must wait, and it's a wait and see, but I can't see uh, um, most cricketers, when you speak to them, that's the game they want to play. That's where they say that's mm -hmm. where that's real cricket. They call it. That is. Yeah. yeah so. Now we've spoken a lot about money. We've spoken about revenue and stuff like that. 
a lot of incidents of corruption coming out, people like being suspended and stuff like that. What is your view of anything like that had to take place at Western Province Cricket? Look, I mean, it's just, for me, it's a simple, it's a very, very simple matter, you know, when it comes to that kind of corrupt activity, you know, um, and if there was any player, you know, that, that, that were, were in our ranks, I don't think our board, our leadership would hesitate, you understand me, in any way to, to punish such a player quite severely. You know, I don't think it's, uh, it's something that, especially in sport, that's thousands and millions watch, you know, that if there was in any way something contrived about it, you know, is, is, is just, yeah, it's just something that we, we shouldn't tolerate under any circumstances. Do you think that that affects sport in general? Like people I see that, they I see their heroes, has, yeah. I think it has affected it. I think since Ansi's, uh, the Ansi saga, mm. um, I think the game of cricket has ne never been the same, you know, and in its attempt to clean it up, in its attempt to, 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 to grow it again, you know, these incidents when they take place, you know, only, only just tarnish the game all over again, you understand, it makes it very difficult for us as administrators, you know, to keep, to keep growing the game, mm. you know, uh, amongst the youth. Um, it's sad when you look today, uh, you know, that, that it's also across the codes, you know, that it's not, it's not confined to cricket, who's probably has the best opportunity for that kind of thing, because it's got so many permutations, um, and it's very statistical, you know, so you have a lot of opportunity for, for the spot fixing and spread betting, you know. Uh, but when you hear that tennis and you hear, you know, that football and all of them are, are somehow entwi intertwined in, in, in these corruption things, you know, then you realize that it's more, it's a values thing today. I think it's become a lot of that. I said to somebody the other day that it takes a lot of manipulation to get somebody like Hansi Kony, a God-fearing man, to be able to do something like that. The manipulation tactics must be out of this world, you know, to get somebody like that to, to agree. I mean, it's... It shows you the power of, of money, the power of manipulation, which is sad. Yeah, no, I agree with you, you know, and I think that's the, the trend in our world today. Mm. Now, we just had a very horrid T20 World Cup over in India. Your, your thoughts on that and um, progress that you think should be made in South African cricket when it comes to the Proteos? Yeah, look, I think very, very importantly, you know, you know, obviously it's very disappointing when your national team, you know, performs below par. Uh, and we know it's below par. You're right. Um, I really cannot talk. You know, I've, o I've often said, you know, that I'm an administrator. Yes. You know, I'm not a cricket expert. Yes. Um, and I acknowledge that that is the case. Uh, but there's certain very common sense things and, and logical things that you see, you know, that most fans see, I think. Mm. Um, you can never ever judge, you know, what's happening in that cauldron, you know, when, when they're in those situations. Uh, but sometimes you question a, a lot of the decisions. Um, I'm going to give you a small example. Aaron Pangiso, he's been the, the talk, a topical, you know, uh, thing for, for months now, yes. since the last World Cup, yes. you know. So yet when he comes to play, he bowls so well. Mm. You know, when he comes to play, he does so well. You know, so you ask yourself the question, where is this fear of playing Pangiso? Yes. And why? You know, so you ask yourself such questions. Um, you know, in a, in a situation where you have most teams playing two to three spinners, you know, we, we, we scared to pick the second one. I know. You know, so yeah. you, 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 those kind of questions, and then you almost say that they, they you know, they, they've almost created their own losses. But do you think the conditions of in India were, I mean, I don't think the conditions were that great. I mean, we saw very low scores on, on many occasions, and I think only the first game that we played against India was a high score. I think that was the highest in the tournament. Actually, I think other than that, the conditions were yeah. were quite were quite bad. I think the the Mumbai pitches normally play more easily, you yeah. know. And then I think when they go to Nagpur and and the, you know when they go to Delhi and these places is much slower. Have you been there? Uh, no, I haven't been there okay. yet. No, no. I'd, and and I think they're much slower wickets and they're much more. They they, they test you a lot better. You well, spinner would have done better. You see, so so it depends a lot on the conditions. Um, yeah, it may not have been ideal for T20 cricket, mm -hmm. you understand me, um, but then also you wouldn't have seen the kind of innings you saw from um, Kohli mm -hmm. in that Aussie game, which was absolutely brilliant, you know, where he played the conditions, he knew what he was doing. Um, and it's not that we don't have players, you understand me, we will probably also have skill levels, you understand me, that are pretty high, you think of the Amlas and the Abies. 
you know, and that I sometimes wonder why our guys can't knuckle down and just think the mm -hmm. same way. But just tell me about some of the international games we can expect uh, later on in the year at, uh, at Western Province Cricket. Well, the coming year we've got Australia in October in a one-day game. Okay. Um, and then we've got Sri Lanka here, New Year's Test Match. Um, and we'll also have them here for the T20 and an ODI. So we'll have another four internationals this year, but three with Sri Lanka, one with the Aussies. The New Year's Test match become a ritual, eh? I mean, every year. Yes. I think there was only one or two years where it didn't happen, but... That was mainly through that India story that it yes. didn't happen, yeah. I mean, yes. India didn't come, you know. Um, and then the following year, we will have a bump. We will have Australia, India, and Sri Lanka, I think, back for three Test matches wow. at Newlands. So amazing stuff. Western Province cricket looking good. As you say, we need to obviously just keep the brand going, keep the momentum going, and uh, just take it forward. So Nabil Dean, uh, CEO of Western Province cricket, thank you for your time. Anything from yourself in closing? Anything you'd like to say? No, to it's the fine. Place? Look, I just think I, all, all I can say is that I hope, you know, across the communities we can continue to grow the game. Uh, but importantly for me, and I didn't say it a lot earlier, mm. that I think it's important for us all to understand that cricket is a game. You know, we tend, and especially amongst our professionals and some parties that are involved, is that we forget that it's only a game and we, let, and we become totally engulfed and embroiled in, in, in it. But we must use the game to improve our society. That's for me the most important thing. And if there's any legacy I'd like to leave at Western Province Cricket is, is creating that, you know, and starting on Newlands Cricket High School and also making sure that all our players are going to be studying, you understand me? and that they've got to create a social conscience, but it doesn't happen overnight, you know, especially after decades of thinking in a different way. Yes. Nabil Dean, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for coming in, CEO of Western Province Cricket. Um, we wish you all the best in your next couple of years, and hopefully you'll carry on in m some more years. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay. It's been Talking Point here with Stephen Taylor on Dean TV. I will catch you back next week, same time, same place. Have a good one. Take care. Bye-bye.